Just like any profession, sound engineers have a set of tools to get the job done. Those tools are our equalizers, compressors, reverb and delay units, gates, expanders, and the many other processors that you may find in a modern digital audio workstation. But knowing what tools you have in your arsenal is not even half the battle. Knowing how to use these tools and understanding everything that they are capable of is what helps to make a versatile and efficient engineer. So in this series, I aim to provide in-depth tutorials on the functions and techniques of these processors to help you create more professional and interesting mixes. All right, this is a general compressor. If you do not know what these parameters do on a base level, I'd suggest going to check out this video linked in the top right hand corner. Otherwise, let's dive into how to use this tool effectively. Before I get too into this video, just know that these tips are generalizations. Nothing I say is going to work for every scenario. No matter what, your ears are always going to be the most efficient and trustworthy tool. If it sounds good, you're doing it right. Hopefully these general tips will give you some ideas where to start and for the most part, they will set you on your way to creating better mixes. So in this episode, we are going to address the attack and release controls. The reason that I want to start with these parameters is that they actually shape how the compressor sounds on a specific element in the mix. We know that the attack and release controls what part of the sonic element will be compressed, the transient, the sustain, or somewhere in the middle. So generally speaking, let's go over some specific settings and what scenarios they could possibly help with. Here's something that might seem obvious when I say it, but I have overlooked this for a while. Before you set any compression parameters, think about the tempo of the song. Is it fast or is it slow? A faster song will most likely have a shorter note duration than a slow song. So naturally, it may be more viable to have a faster attack and faster release times so that the compressor will actually affect the bulk of the note duration. This goes for slower songs as well. We would generally want the compressor to affect a larger portion of the note so it may be more viable to have a slower attack and slower release. This is usually a good place to start while thinking about setting your attack and release parameters. Even if you might start with a slower attack and release on songs with longer note duration, a fast attack and release is still viable. A typical scenario for this would be making the transient pop by placing the attack right after the peak as to further accentuate the transient by compressing what comes right after it. If you look at this picture, you'll notice the transient happens right before the compressor line begins to compress the sound. However, the opposite of this may not be as viable. Having slow attack and slow release on songs with quick note duration may result in your compressor missing the note entirely and rendering the processor completely ineffective. So that addresses the first rule of thumb when setting attack and release times. I'm going to mention this one more time before I move forward. These are general rules that may or may not apply. Your ears are number one. I simply hope this gives you some direction when trying to find the correct compression setting. Okay. The next tip has to do primarily with the attack parameter and how it is possible to affect the relationship between the sonic elements in a mix with varied attack times. We know faster attack times tend to be more effective at compressing the beginning of the note duration, which is also known as the transient, while slower attack times tend to let the transient through. What's important to understand about the transient is that it what gives the instrument its pop. It's what makes it stick out. So knowing this, I hope it makes sense that a faster attack time might be more appropriate for the instruments in the back of the mix as to reduce their transient and have them not as prevalent in the mix, and then to have a slower attack time on elements in the front so that they have more of a transient and more pop as to be more noticeable. This tip should be used with caution and common sense. Yes, it does make sense that you want the sonic elements that are supposed to be in the front pop more than those in the back. But there's one big exception to this idea. This exception is the drums. Even though drums are almost always placed in the back of the mix, they naturally have a short transient. You really would not want to compress the transient too much with fast attack times as they could lose some of their punch. So as always, use your ears and make sure that the parameters you set benefit the cause. Otherwise, I have found this technique to work in many situations to help place certain elements more distinctively in the sonic environment that you are creating with your mix. Just to make this idea a bit more clear, let me give you one more example. Say we have a rhythm guitar and a lead guitar. The lead guitar is about to start a solo while the rhythm guitar is supporting it with a chord progression. Generally, which guitar do you think should have a faster attack time? 
You want the transient of the guitar that is soloing to still be prominent and detailed, so you do not want too fast of an attack time as to let the transient through. Where it might help to compress the transient of the rhythm guitar a bit to help distinguish the guitars from each other and make the chords being played by that rhythm guitar a bit more consistent and level. Finally, my last tip with the attack and release controls is kind of an all else fails solution. Let's say none of the tips I just provided seem to work for you. Well, that's actually a good thing that you know that because that means you are using your ears and not just following what someone said online. I applaud you for that. The last tip will help you find that sweet spot for setting your attack and release for any instrument. Start by bringing your ratio and threshold to a point where you can easily hear the compression kicking in. I'd suggest at least a 4 to 1 ratio for starters. Next, place the attack and release controls all the way to the right as to have the slowest attack and release settings available. Now, starting with the attack control, slowly start to turn it counterclockwise until you hear the transient of that sound you are compressing become diminished. This is how you can find the transient of the sound, and from here you can either choose to slow the attack if you want the transient to come through, or speed up the attack if you wanted to compress it more. Now, do the same for the release, except this time focus on the sustain of the sonic element. Slowly quicken the release time until you st really start to hear a pump in the sustain. This will tell you where in the sound the compressor is beginning to release, and you can either dial it faster if you want a smaller part of the signal to be compressed, or slower if you want more of the signal to be compressed. Once again, make sure that you have the ratio and threshold up to a significant point so that you can really hear these adjustments. You can always bring them back down once you set your attack and release. So there you have it. These are my three tips for setting your attack and release controls on your compressor. I hope you learned that the attack and release play a large role in affecting how the compressor sounds and gives you some ideas and motivation on how to set these parameters to fit your needs. My next episode will be going over some more compression tips and tricks that have to deal with how you can apply compression in unique ways to achieve unusual but interesting results. So stay tuned for that. Hope everyone is having a good day and I'll see you in the next video.